What a difference a couple of weeks make. I don't have much to offer on the crisis right now that's affecting everybody and changing the way we live, but I do hope everybody out there is staying healthy and staying safe, and I wish you and your family and your friends the best, and I do want to say thanks for taking the time to listen, and I hope it makes your day a little bit more tolerable. A quick note on this episode before it gets going, I recorded this about a month ago. It's about a speech called This is Water by David Foster Wallace, and I think the message that David Foster Wallace was trying to get across is very important in normal everyday life, but I also think in times of crisis like this, that message is even more valuable, in my opinion at least. That being said, I did record this a month ago, so if I was to sit down and record this today, the episode might sound a little differently as far as some of the examples and analogies that I use, but in general, I still think the overall theme is more important maybe now more than ever. So with that out of the way, I'll get to it, but I do have one more announcement that's going to come after the episode's over, so if you stay tuned, I'm going to be talking about a way that you can get a couple more hours of content from me during this time of isolation. So if you're looking for some extra education or extra entertainment, or if you're looking for something to listen to while you do yard work or household chores, or if you're just trying to avoid your significant other, stay tuned after the episode. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about narratives in history and the things that we emphasize or don't emphasize in our study of the past. What elements, what tropes, what themes do we place importance on, and what stories or elements of stories from the past do we not tend to focus on as much? As David Foster Wallace points out in his commencement address to a college in the year 2005, you can apply these questions of emphasis and importance and focus and attention not just to the study of history or the study of whatever your discipline is, but to your everyday life and the way we think about the world, the way we encounter the world, and the way we react to the environment around us. David Foster Wallace opens up his address by telling a short story that's meant to emphasize an important thematic point, which he spends much of the speech, much of his essay here, discussing. He says, quote, There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? End quote. According to David Foster Wallace, quote, the point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude. But the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life-or-death importance. End quote. You see, for David Foster Wallace, the story of the fish who has no idea what water is is not just a humorous joke or a useful parable, but it's actually the fundamental truth of human existence and maybe realizing that perhaps in some ways we are all fish who don't know what water is. That is the fundamental insight of a good education. The goal of learning and education should not be to fill your brain up 
with knowledge, insight, and facts, which will, of course, soon be forgotten and are probably useless in the first place unless you know how to utilize them in a meaningful way. But according to David Foster Wallace, education should be more about learning how to think from a student perspective and maybe teaching how to think from a teacher perspective. And then to a greater extent, education is simply about exercising control over your personal choice of what to think about. He says, quote, the really significant education in thinking that we're supposed to get in a place like this isn't really about the capacity to think, but rather about the choice of what to think about, end quote. The idea that education is not really about knowledge or filling your brain up with facts is disconcerting, I think, for a lot of people. Just to connect this to my sort of field, which is history, I think that the way most people view history as a discipline is the wrong way to go about it. For example, we've all met the person who can list off all of the state names and state capitals and the person who can list all of the presidents from first to last in order including their middle names, and maybe we've all met that person who, when they want to have a history conversation with you, they are disappointed that you don't know some obscure fact about medieval castles or 14th century pirate ships like they do. And the problem with this way of doing history is when you ask this person to start taking all those facts and taking all that knowledge and getting it to start working together. Oftentimes, it's difficult for this person to start putting together broader trends, interactions between different disciplines, explanatory frameworks, historical thinking. These are the things that I think end up being more important, at least in my view, in the discipline of history questions of meaning and emphasis and importance and finding ways to question different perspectives. Furthermore, asking questions about all of those things that you're asking questions about, rather than blindly accepting narratives that are given to you or blindly reciting facts. Because the reality is two people can take a look at the same set of facts and they can come up with totally different conclusions as to what they mean. David Foster Wallace tells another story in his speech about a religious guy and an atheist who are sort of arguing over a near-death experience that one of them had. The religious guy views this near-death experience as a pathway towards God or something more divine, whereas the atheist just looked at the natural causes of how he was able to get out of that situation. And of course, the standard narrative says that two people can believe totally different things based on the same set of facts, and that's great, but oftentimes the analysis stops there. But more interesting questions might be, why is this the case? Why is it that two people can believe different things based on the same set of facts, what makes someone believe something, and what individual personal choices do people make that allow them to believe the things they believe? How do we avoid the problem of certainty? Oftentimes we are so certain of the things we believe that we refuse to see things from the other side and question why we think the things we personally think. Referring back to that story of the religious person and the atheist, David Foster Wallace says, quote, The religious dogmatist's problem is exactly the same as the story's unbeliever, blind certainty, a closed-mindedness that amounts to an imprisonment so total that the prisoner doesn't even know he's locked up. The point here is that I think this is one part of what teaching me how to think is supposed to mean to be just a little less arrogant, to have just a little critical awareness about myself and my certainties, 
because a huge percentage of the stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is, it turns out, totally wrong and diluted, end quote. He points out that in the same way that the fish is so totally absorbed in the world of the fish, where the fish has no reason to bother wondering what water is or how it affects them, in the same way, we as human beings tend to automatically, implicitly think that we are the center of the universe. He says this is not meant to be some sort of moral preaching. This is just a fact of experience. Every person on planet Earth, or at least most of us, interpret everything that's happening through the lens of the self. We all feel like we are inside our bodies interacting with the world. We are either doing things to change the world around us, or the world around us is changing us personally. But it's all happening through this lens of us, the self. This is a implicit fact of experience And for David Foster Wallace, the goal is now to adjust this default setting. And the way to adjust this default setting is not to gather more knowledge or gather more intelligence or gather more facts. The way to do it is to pay attention to what you're paying attention to. Pay attention a little bit more to the world around you and pay attention a little bit more to what's happening inside of you. According to David Foster Wallace, learning how to think really means controlling what you think about and how you think about it. He says, quote, Learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Think of the old cliche about the mind being an excellent servant, but a terrible master. End quote. So far, he's claiming that if we, as humans, just sort of go by on our default setting, where we interpret everything as something that's happening to us directly in the center of our own self-universe. This leads us potentially to become hypnotized by the voice inside our head, not considering other perspectives, not particularly even noticing that we should be considering other perspectives. This might, of course, lead to feelings of blind certainty And all of the interactions we have from that point forward are going to be colored by that absolute certainty that may or may not turn out to be incorrect. David Foster Wallace then goes on to point out that if we can't choose what we're going to think about and how we think about it, if we just are on a default setting where we are constantly reacting to the things that are happening to us, then dealing with life and dealing with the day-to-day, what he calls the day-to-day trenches of adult existence, is going to be incredibly difficult. He tells another story, this time about going to work every day and going to the supermarket. I think it might be a story most of us are familiar with. I'm not going to quote much of it, but the basic idea is you can imagine someone getting up early for work, They're tired, they proceed to sit in traffic for who knows how many hours, they get to work at their boring and monotonous job, they work hard, they're tired, they end up wanting to go home, but then they have to go to the supermarket because they don't have any food, they go to the supermarket, all sorts of small and petty calamities are happening to them, they have to wait in line, there's obnoxious parents yelling at their kids or talking loud on the cell phone. The lines are long. They can't find the food they want to find in the ginormous store. So he's asking, how do we deal with the boredom, the routine, and the frustration of the petty things in life? He says, quote, The point is that petty, frustrating crap like this is exactly where the work of choosing is going to come in. 
because the traffic jams and crowded aisles and long checkout lines give me time to think. And if I don't make a conscious decision about how to think and what to pay attention to, I'm going to be pissed and miserable every time I have to shop because my natural default setting is the certainty that situations like this are really all about me, about my hungriness and my fatigue and my desire to just get home. And it's going to seem for all the world like everybody else is just in my way. And who are all these people in my way? And look at how repulsive most of them are and how stupid and cow-like and dead-eyed and non-human they seem in the checkout line or at how annoying and rude it is that people are talking loudly on cell phones in the middle of the line, and look at how deeply and personally unfair this is. End quote. I think his point here is that if we elect not to choose what to think about, not to choose how to think, and instead just operate on the default setting of me being the center of the universe and anything good that happens to me being a personal boon or anything bad that happens to me a major inconvenience, if we operate this way, there's a very good chance that our experience of life is going to be miserable. Keep in mind that this speech was given in 2005, but in many ways it seems absolutely prophetic for where humanity was going. Think about how this logic applies to the social media era, interactions on Twitter and Facebook, how everyday social interactions have changed everything from day-to-day life all the way up to the highest levels of politics have changed as a result of this very way of thinking being applied and dispersed throughout the world in the social media, internet, technology age. Think about the absolute certainty that many people operate with on the internet. Think about echo chambers that are created on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Think about how oftentimes in these anonymous internet interactions, we tend not to give the other side the benefit of the doubt. We tend to view them as inconveniencing us personally, which of course then perpetuates a cycle of our own absolute certainty and things spiral downhill from there. So David Foster Wallace is saying that the default setting of interpreting these misfortunes and the bad things that happen to you as your own personal misfortune could lead to problems, but there is an alternative. And the alternative is to choose to think about things a little bit differently. Maybe those miserable humans in traffic have good reason to be there. Maybe the lady yelling at her kids obnoxiously in the grocery store is just having a bad day. Maybe that anonymous person on Twitter that's upsetting you actually agrees with you on more than you think. David Foster Wallace says, quote, Of course, none of this is likely, but it's also not impossible. It just depends what you want to consider. If you're automatically sure that you know what reality is and you are operating on your default setting, then you, like me, probably won't consider possibilities that aren't annoying and miserable. But if you really learn how to pay attention, then you will know there are other options. It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell type situation as not only meaningful, but sacred, on fire with the same force that made the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. Not that that mystical stuff is necessarily true. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. This, I submit, is the freedom of a real education of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. End quote. In the realm of psychology, they call this the fundamental attribution error. The idea is that when somebody harms us or does something that we find insulting or pejorative, we tend to interpret this as them being a bad person or a horrible person. If somebody cuts me in line at the grocery store, that's because they're a horrible person. 
if somebody cuts me off in traffic, that's because they're a terrible driver and they're insensitive. We are interpreting that situation and attributing the bad things that happened to that person's core personality and who they are as a person. But we often fail to attribute those bad things to more important causal elements like the situation or the environment or what type of day that person was having. When we make mistakes, it's because we were having a bad day or we were upset or we needed to get somewhere quickly. But when other people make mistakes, it's because they're bad people. Again, maybe the person cutting you off in the line at the grocery store had a personal emergency. Maybe the person cutting you off in traffic was on the way to the hospital. Maybe you were in their way, inconveniencing them. If all of this stuff about sitting in traffic and being at the grocery store seems a little bit like first world problems, like clearly there's bigger issues that people in their lives should be dealing with, maybe, but you're missing the point. David Foster Wallace is talking about some fundamental truths about consciousness. He's talking about what it means to get an education. He's talking about thinking and how unconscious default settings like the fish in water are creating problems much bigger than sitting in traffic or being at the grocery store. He's getting at the heart of the appeal of living an examined life, whether that's through religion or through atheism or through ethical principles or whatever the case may be. It's about getting away from the things that unconsciously control us. It's about trying to find freedom in a world where we're constantly being peppered unknowingly with ways to think and narratives to view the world and reasons to hate our enemies. He says that most things we worship unconsciously eventually will destroy us. He says, quote, If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They are default settings. End quote. The point is that it's easy to slip into these unconscious ways of thinking. It's easy to swim around in the waters of self-obsession that David Foster Wallace points out are often seeped in power and money, appearance and fame, and the petty day-to-day -day of everyday life. And the sad thing is that most of us don't even realize we're swimming around in that. According to David Foster Wallace, real freedom, real education, real knowledge comes from living an examined life, or at least trying to. There's going to be speed bumps and slip-ups and regressions along the way, but it's something. It's conscious. It's a choice. He says, quote, The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, unsexy ways every day. That is real freedom. That is being educated and understanding how to think. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, 
the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. End quote. For David Foster Wallace, much like the fish at the beginning of the story, truth might come from what's hidden around us in plain sight. He says, quote, It is about the real value of a real education, which has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness, awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us, all the time, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over. This is water. All right. Thanks for listening. As always, I do appreciate it. This episode here is sort of an introduction to a new series I'm going to be doing on prehistory, early man, Paleolithic, Neolithic man. I think it's going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to rolling that out over the next couple of weeks. Now, one thing I'm going to be doing starting right now is on Patreon, I'm not going to charge anyone anything for the next couple of weeks or months, at least until I either change my mind or this situation begins to get resolved. So what that means is if you wanted to get on Patreon, sign up for the tier that gives you access to the bonus feed, right now there's five bonus episodes up there, you're not going to be charged for it, including one I just did on the historiography of the 1918 influenza pandemic that some of you might find interesting. Again, the idea is if you are bored or if you're looking for entertainment or if you're looking for podcast to listen to, that would give you access to a few more episodes, and hopefully that helps you spend your time during this horrible situation we all find ourselves in. So if that seems like it's something that interests you, go ahead and do it. Again, I'm not going to charge anyone anything for the next couple of weeks or months. Once I start to resume normal Patreon operations and charge people the normal amount based on the tier they're signed up for, I will give everybody plenty of notice. So weeks or a month or so in advance, I will let everyone know normal operations are going to resume. And if at that point you want to bail out so that you don't have to pay anything at any point, then go for it. No questions asked, nothing but gratitude from me on my end. From here on out, I probably won't comment too much on what's going on. I'll try to just stick with my normal release schedule for normal episodes. I hope you stay healthy, stay safe, stay happy. See you in a couple weeks.